So greetings. We are here um, ready to bring a, a wonderful workshop. I'm going to be in conversation with Miss Claudette Faison, and she's going to tell you a little bit about herself, and then we'll get into our topic. Yeah, we can, you know, there's so much to me, so but I'll limit it to the to who I am in this call. And in this call, I'm the CEO of a not-for-profit that I'm one of the founders of it, but I've been the executive director and the CEO of Unlocking Futures, formerly known as Youth at Risk since 1989. So um, we've worked uh, on every continent with the exception of Antarctica. We worked with over close to 12,000 families. And what we, what we do is we provide spiritual transformation education to our clients. And the results of that is early, early childhood trauma, whether it's personal trauma, cultural trauma, generational trauma, community trauma gets healed. And then people's lives, we produce sustainable results. I mean, 10 years later, you see the results. 20 years later, you, you see the results where their lives are forever altered. Uh, and, and they are on a path that they never thought was possible. So, and I just want to say it's, um, I don't, you know, as I say, we do spiritual work and that's who, I know I'm going to talk about the board of directors, but first and foremost, I want you to know the big board of my directors is the spirit world. That's who really run things. And I'm going to tell you about how to do it in the world and how, how to let spirit run it. All right, cool. Thanks. Um, so I am Kairishi Wigginton. I am the um, special pro pro programs manager for the Center for Third World Organizing. And this workshop that we're presenting for you today is a part of our Living Liberation um, pre-recorded sessions. And our topic that we're going to focus on is building a liberatory staff and board, right? And and that just already sounds like a mouthful. <laughs> um, the, the few conversations that me and Ms. Claudette have had have been like, well, what does that actually mean in practice? Um, so I've come up with a couple of questions and we're going to just kind of talk through and hopefully what we're able to present for you all today will uh, help you get closer to uh, implementing it in your own work. Okay. So I guess my first question is like when, so when I listen to you talking, Ms. Claudette, and you're talking about the, 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 the mission of your organization and, and the focus of its work that to me, freedom and liberation are all up in and through that, right? Um, and it's it seems like it starts with self. So I'm curious how you see freedom um, and liberation um, being connected to your work. I think, any, first of all, I think anyone that's in the line of business that you're in and that I am in, we are liberators. We're liberating people from the past, liberating people from shame and guilt so that they have access to freedom. That's right. Because, you know, when you're with shame and guilt and limitations and conversation for lack, is is as though you're you have a foot nailed, you know, Jesus was nailed to the cross, but we have a foot nailed to no possibility, nailed to shame and pain. And when your feet are nailed, you cannot go into the future. You can't be in the present. You're just always dragging the past with you. And in that lies no freedom. That's right. So I, is that similar to how you would talk about liberation and freedom? Yeah, definitely. I think that um, one of our goals is to to think about, I think often organizations focus on the work externally, um, but I think that I can't liberate the world unless I'm liberating myself, right? And I think that it starts with me and then um, 
moves out, vibrates out to the relationships around me, right? So how am I talking to my coworkers? How am I with um, my supervisor? What is the culture of the organization? How do I feel when I come to work every day? Like all of that. And then it radiates out to our clients or um, um, constituents or those people that we're ser- we serve or are in partnership with, right? So yeah. I like that you talk about, it starts with me first. Um, and what when we put in our both our statements, so we say we believe that transformation is possible at any time, at any place, and with anyone. Mm-hmm. Bridging the gap, being generous, we bridge the gap between insurmountable odds for ourselves and others. And it was crucial that we inserted ourselves in there. Mm-hmm. And and the 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 board of directors we say this 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 motto before every board meeting, every staff meeting, um, so that we didn't want to be like uh, not schizophrenic but hypocritical that what we're saying we're doing for the community and what we're doing for our clients that they couldn't see it in in our own organization. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. My father, you know, I'm Caribbean, and my father would say, the fish always think from the head. The fish always think from the head. And mm-hmm. what he meant by that is before you look out and see where there's a problem, just go to the head. And it, all of us that are working in communities, we are the head. Mm-hmm. And in Unlocking Futures, we have one of our philosophical underpinnings is our clients won't do as we say do they will do as we do that's right so we have to be liberated first and and everybody knows this and you learned it in about third grade when you said monkey see monkey do monkey looks just like you Mm -hmm. so if we want to liberate our can bring liberation to our communities and to our clients, we have to be that way. That's right. That's right. Yep. I agree. Um, when you think about liberation, how does, like, I love that you, you all center uh, your model um, and with, and really your intention at every meeting. Right. Um, so when you think about how that uh, bleeds into um, like your hiring process, right? Like, when you think about the kind of staff that you're looking for, how does it, how does that, that show up? Well, we've been along for, around for almost 34 years. And I could tell you in the beginning, we would say Youth at Risk is a volunteer driven organization. And when, what that allowed for was we were able to develop people who were aligned with our mission and our programs and our way of being. And those people became our first employees. Mm -hmm. You know, our first, about our first 15 people were people who were either former clients or people who had volunteered in the organization for five plus Mm -hmm. years. And I'm going to tell you when, when it shifted and we're back to it, but we had a major breakdown when we received um, certain kind of grants that required that um, employees have this kind of, of, of um, resume experience or this kind of education. And I'm going to tell you, my organization could have gone out of existence existence when we started, when we hired employees versus staff. Mm -hmm. And employees are people who will tell you it's not in my job description. Mm -hmm. It's, um, they'll tell you, um, am I going to, they'll say, am I comp time, you know, with staff and we could do comp time and, Employees want to come time. No, honey, that's time and a half. So how how we were able to maintain ourselves and we still maintain ourselves is that the 
the the training and development that we provide for staff. Now, how do we get the staff? Who do we hire? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell you if we haven't made mistakes. I mean, we've made so many mistakes about hiring staff until we learned. Mm -hmm. That's that's I mean, employees. Mm -hmm. And that's how come I'm good at it because we made mistakes. And some of the mistakes we made was... Um, once, not, not some of the mistakes, what we learned, you know, simple questions. Ask somebody what they do on the weekend. Mm. What they do on the weekends will let you know who they think they really are. Mm -hmm. If they just go home and hibernate, you know, they're really not community organizers, networking. If they say they just go, you know, they're not going to tell me in an interview, they go party, but you know, you ask certain kind of questions they may say i i party or if they say i i go to church a lot you know they may be bringing in dogma and that's not consistent with with liberation mm -hmm. you know we have to make sure we're not so what we're looking for is people who would do this for free Yes. And then we pay them. Yes, yes. Yes, that's right. That they're passionate about it. It is connected. I always tell people, um, I only do heart work. All my jobs are heart jobs. I've never worked at Target. Nothing wrong with Target. <laughs> never worked at um McDonald's. Nothing wrong with it. But those aren't the kind of jobs that I've ever had. All of them are ones that are connected directly to the the things that I love um and and um and the work that I love like doing. And when you hire those kind of staff people, you know, I'm famous for, you know, I'm of the age where Star Trek, you know, that was mm -hmm. a show that I watched all the time. And I love when Captain Kirk would say to number two, make it so. So when you have staff people who are working from their passion and they come with an idea that we should do this and we should do that, then I would just say, make it so, because it was their passion that gave them the idea. And that's how the organization grew. Mm -hmm. Not because I was able to say, okay, now we're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. You know, I'm limited. And so recruiting staff people who are passionate. And the other thing is solution oriented, mm -hmm. that they can see that instead of, you know, what the difference, I'm going to keep talking about the difference between staff and employees. Staff people are solution oriented. Mm -hmm. They will say, this is missing. We need to do this. An employee then says, this place is unorganized. Mm -hmm. um, what's your problem? There's no structure here. That, but they will complain while the staff person We'll see what was missing, where the hole is, and create mm -hmm. a structure for that. Mm -hmm. And they do that inside the organization. If you can't create solutions inside of the organization, you can't create outside of the organization. That's right. Because it's the same person going, going out. That's right. That's right. Yep, you're right. Um, and you can see it. It, it, it doesn't read as authentic. Um. How do you, how do you, how does that then translate to the staff culture that, that you're creating? Like your ability um, to have people um, there. What I hear you saying is that there's a level of buy-in that people already, a willingness that they have to come to the door with, right? Um, these staff members. And then how do you then get them to buy into like this broader um, like direction that you're headed in? Lots of training and development. Lots of training and development, not necessarily on their skill set. Mm -hmm. Training and development to learn how we do whatever dance we're doing. You mm -hmm. know, how they do that down south, maybe. Oh, we actually have a, a, a process where we, we demonstrate uh, People who are going, they are in McDonald's. 
-hmm. standing in front of the cashier asking for a Whopper. And only Burger King sell Whoppers, mm -hmm. not McDonald's. And mm -hmm. it's a whole skit and the, the people behind the person that's asking for the Whopper gets pissed off mm. because they're asking for a Whopper. And the whole point of this is when we're bringing people into the organization is wherever you came from, they may have stole Whoppers. And, and I'm saying those Whoppers taste good. They're, they're mm -hmm. excellent. But we don't do Whoppers here. Mm -hmm. So you, what you have to notice, the more experience people have and the more successful they were in another place, mm -hmm. they will bring those structures into your place mm -hmm. and we we sell we sell big mats mm -hmm. we don't sell quarter pounders so without training and development and having people see the distinctions that we are and one of our phil philosophical underpinnings mm -hmm. and i tell you, what i've done what i've done is usually i would hire people in the, from the beginning no, you, now you are consultant for your own contract for three months. Mm -hmm. And then if you make it for three months, because you you know people you know people in three months, you know what who they are, what they are capable of. And if they are able to make it after three months, they come on staff, but they still uh all their benefits are accrued from day one. Got you. Now, here's the trick in that. I've had people who we've hired who weren't a match after two months, then I have my unemployment partial goes up and I have to pay their unemployment forever and ever, and they were only there for two months. So it's important how you recruit people, where you get them from. Um, I've had uh, people who sent me re uh, references and that their references were fake. Mm -hmm. I had two people in my 30 something years. As a person, I had to uh, write a reference. And so if you call me up, what I like doing is calling the former employers. Mm -hmm. Now I say, I don't want just general, I want people who you worked with, work under, not your coworker. I want to speak to the HR person so that I can vet them, vet them. Like, who are these people? And if you call me, I'm going to have to tell you the truth about the person. I want them to get the job, but you have to tell me what the position is. And I'll tell you if, if they did similar work for me, the quality of the work. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. all of what it takes to hire people is it's not an easy task. Uh, but w once they're in the door, is how do you keep them for... I went to a party last night mm -hmm. and I was who was there, and I hadn't seen these people in a long time, was at least five of my former staff and of these five former staff, actually six, there were people who were with me for 20 years mm. and for 15 years and for eight years. And that's who you want to stay in the organization because just the, the same way you have to brand your products your services, you have to brand your staff. Your staff have to be branded. Now, you may, so let's talk about board members for a moment, okay? Uh -huh. I want to come back to the branding staff too, but okay. okay no, let's let's stay with the branding staff. Because I might forget it. <laughs> oh, well, I'm just curious, like, what is, like, you said it and I was like, yes. But then I was like, well, what does that actually mean? Like, what does that actually look like? branding your staff and why is that beneficial so what what it means is that there's wherever the let's say i have to do uh uh, uh the media calls us or 
We have to do a piece for the newspaper epic. Nobody does newspapers anymore, but they do newspapers, just don't buy it on paper. Mm -hmm. Everyone has to have the same language. We can't say, I can't say we transform the chaotic lives of young people. And then someone says, well, we work with young people and and we love doing it. Yeah. Okay. The, lang the language has to be the same. Just like when you're branding, you're doing your graphics. Everybody has to use the same font when they use the logo, mm. the same colors. So no, we don't all have to dress alike, but we all have to speak the same message at the, at the same time. That's branding your staff. So when somebody when they go to a meeting and they speak, they go, oh, that's an unlocking futures person. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a, an unlocking futures person. Even if they didn't hear their introductions that I'm from Unlocking Futures, the way we speak and how we express ourselves have to be branded. Mm -hmm. That that is a really powerful thing. I think. Um, when I was listening to you talk, I, it made me realize people often bring folks on and they, when they think about onboarding them, I think they're like, oh, uh, this is what you need to, for your email. And, oh, excuse me. This is what you need for your email and, um, uh, meetings are like, are here and da, 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 all of that. But, and I don't know that I've really ever been on an, on a staff where, maybe a few times where the idea was to give like to train folks on, this is the way we do things. This is our way. Um, and that is a very big, that's a key thing. I, I think that that's, that tends to be a rub, especially if you're a newer organization and you're trying to cement your identity and you have those people coming in looking for whoppers, but you sell big Macs, right? Like that. And, and I think that there, like that's, there's a tension point there. I think that a lot of relationship work relationships break down because of that tension point. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. Cause so I think that, um, that really made me like that, that was powerful for me. I think that more folks need to think about, um, how do we make sure that everybody is on the same page? And so then we're moving forward together. So, um, in order to be a volunteer in our organization, you have to go through a 15-minute mentor training, coaches training, volunteer training. All staff have to go through that training. All staff have to witness when we, we do retreats with the young people. Um, they have to, because the same information we give the young people is the same information we give our staff people. So training mm -hmm. and development um, is critical. Mm -hmm. um, the, the piece that... Here's the other thing about the organization. If we're saying that we work with young people who have sustainable results and we're working with families and they their lives are forever altered, our lives better be forever altered. That's right. And what was all, so, you know, there's this thing that I say to people and I say, what's the, what's the best time you've had in your life? And like you're 33 years old. And if you tell me something that happened to you when you were 17, I, I, I can't hire you. Mm. That because you stopped. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like 17, it's, it's like, what, what what did you do with the last X amount of years? Yeah. So what happens as staff people so that we don't get comfortable? We have an underpinning. We, we tell this to our clients and I tell it to the staff. We want you to be comfortable being uncomfortable mm -hmm. because when you're learning something new, you're uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And we want you to get comfortable. So people work with us, um, staff people, they may stay for two years or three years, but I want you to know that when they leave, mm -hmm. they are trained and developed at a level 
at a level. So they may come in as a, a, a program staff person, but by the time in two or three years, they'll leave at the level of a program coordinator mm -hmm. and then at the program manager or pro director of programs mm -hmm. because they have to keep excelling the same way the clients have to keep excelling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, 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 that's wonderful. Thank you. Okay. So you, you were talking about the board. You said, let's talk about the board. So, you know, the boards, boards are governance board and they really are there to make sure that we have fiduciary accountability. That means that the money that we're raising is spent with integrity, that we have paper trail. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, board members, I think all board members, we ask all the board members to go through the same training. We put board members on a, a year um, probation, not a probation, but let's date for a year before we marry. Now, board members are very useful for the community outreach. Mm -hmm. I have corporate board members. I have political board members. I'm not, as the CEO, I don't rub shoulders with those people mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's important that board members buy in to, not only to the mission, we don't need people no good, you know, people who just want to come and say, I, I'm on a board. We need board members who will roll up their sleeve mm -hmm. externally to the organization. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you're a young, fledgling organization, and I remember when we were one, we needed board members to put their hands in the organization. Like, help us with with HR policies, help mm. us with our taxes, help us with, we didn't need board members to, we need board members who could help us learn how to um, write grants. I remember I had a board member who was at United Way. Mm -hmm. She was a, a vice president at United Way. She was a board member and she was one of the people who taught me how to write grants. Mm -hmm. So the board is has to have that same commitment, not necessarily to the, to not only to the organization, but also to the client, to who we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, most people want to talk about just the clients, but when the board can make something happen inside of the organization and become a part of the board organization. Um, it's, it's more powerful. Some of the things I've, it hasn't happened to me because I nip it in the bud. Mm -hmm. When I see board members who want to, again, they see what they do in corporate America or wherever they were, and they want to go get this Whopper and we sell McDonald's. Mm -hmm. Okay. We, we, and we could sell a better, um, come on, let's talk. Thank I don't know enough. <laughs> I, I don't know enough vegan food for me to talk vegan. And I know a lot of people like, why McDonald's? Why Burger King? We don't eat meat. I apologize to you people. I just don't know any vegan recipes. I don't eat pork, so if you if that's all right with you, but I'm gonna stick with Burger King and McDonald's, okay, people. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't mind if you tell me how I could make my Whopper more efficiently, more effectively, more tastefully. But let's start with the Whopper. So board members have to also uh, respect the leadership of the organization. Now, twice I had to check board members who, and I said, are you are, are you trying to take my job? Mm. Uh, you know, I'm Claudette, so I speak this way. I had to check them because it was too much tension. 
Mm -hmm. Here's something I want to let you know, um, people who are entrepreneurs. And as if you're founding, if you founded your organization, you is a not for profit. You are still an entrepreneur mm -hmm. because you've taken it from nowhere, from no existence, and now you're building it, and you're building it, and you're building it. One thing corporate American people or people who have jobs, they, they, they don't have the stress of where, how are we going to pay, make payroll and rent? Mm -hmm. They don't have those quests. They don't have that. So sitting on somebody paying them 60, 160, 200 K a year, they don't understand the the struggle of that it takes five months to write a grant that takes five months to tell you if you got the grant. <laughs> they don't understand the, they, they just want to know what can you do to raise money? What can you do to raise money? What can you do to raise money? You don't need board members that ask that question repeatedly. Again, as I said, as with staff, you need board members who will bring solutions. You need board members who are truly serving as ambassadors mm -hmm. for your not-for-profit. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. Um, there was a question I had. I love that you talk about the the need for the board to be bought in in the same way. Um, and, and, and I've seen it before. Um, I used to work at this school in Oakland, um, Oakland high school. And when you go on campus, what was very clear was that it, everybody on campus from the custodian to the principal, and there were like four principals. Um, there was a principal and he had like four or five vice principals, but everybody from him, from the custodians, to the principal understood why they were there. And that was in service of those youth on that campus. And you could tell, and it was in the way that they uh, mopped the floors and organized the lunchroom and how they commun how everybody communicated with the young people, the way the environment felt. It, it was so important that everybody got that we are here. And most, a lot of times you go using a school as an example, you go on campus and the people are working against each other, right? And it's like, wait, we are here for one goal. And I think, so that comes up for me when you're talking about even the board being bought in so that we are not working against each other, that everybody understands why we are doing this thing. And that, um, and that helps move it forward. What are some like um, last like gems? What I really want, I would love like, um, like three pieces of advice for people who are starting their organizations and wanting um, to to create a more liberatory board and staff environment. Um, and then I'm going to ask you for some homework for them. I don't know about the homework. Um, I, all I remember if you put, tell me I'm going to give you homework at the end of the period, I would raise my hand like right before and I said, could I go to the bathroom and I get the pass? <laughs> and I, I wasn't there when they said, did you do the homework? I wasn't there when you gave out any homework. So I wouldn't want people like to click me off because they go, oh, now she's going to talk about homework. We're going to click off. I got I got a phone call. <laughs> so I don't know about this homework thing. But what do I want to say? Uh, when you're building a board, uh, I don't, you have to have diversity. But yes, diversity in skill and diversity in in uh, in what they're bringing to the party. You have to have diversity with all the, the binary, the genders, the age, um, the color, the ethnicity, the religion. I think that makes a healthy board. I think that makes a healthy board because that's the world we live in. If, when I work, I work with, families in margins, in the margins, whether I'm working in India or I'm working in Europe. I'm, you know, in Europe, I work with the gypsies, you know, so these are the people in the margins. 
And if I only had gypsies on the board, I will be thinking inside of a structure that uh, inside of a paradigm that may not eliminate or add to what I'm doing. So mm -hmm. just as the young people need and families need to expand how they see the world, diversity, and when I say diversity is honoring diversity, Mm -hmm. Not not a me or you world. I uh I was working with a, a board a chairman of the board last month and I said, Well, you need to find out about the other people in your industry. And she said, Yeah, they're my competitors. I said, No, mm -hmm. they're not your competitors, they're your collaborators. Mm -hmm. And so my that's my second thing. Diversity, the second thing is collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. I'm really of the belief we we may not need so many not-for-profits. You know, if you go in certain neighborhoods, it's like they all got Kentucky Fried Chicken, um, Kansas Fried Chicken, Bojangle Fried Chicken. We may not need another chicken factory on the street. We may not need another liquor store. We may not need another not-for-profit if we can collaborate mm -hmm. for coalition building. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing that I would say as you're, raised, as you're building your organization, meet with people like me who've made all of the mistakes and we've come through it. Mm. So I may not be able to tell you about social media, TikTok. I mean, I still think TikTok is something I should eat. Like, you got any TikToks or some can? I don't know nothing about no TikTok. But I do know about building and maintaining the organization. Social media, I, you know, I still think, you know, LOL means living out loud. I didn't know it mean they were laughing at me. I'm like, well, everybody's living out loud. Come on. So, but the things you have to do is, um, I might be old, but I look good for my age. I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm 68 years old and I look damn good. Woohoo! <laughs> I look good. <laughs> but because you have to um, stay young. And what I mean when I say stay young, that means you can learn and expand forever. And an old dog, they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, this old dog over here can teach you some tricks you even didn't even know was available. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that I, I would say. I would say brand your, your staff, brand your board members, um, make it a requirement that, um, that board members are where the young people or your whoever your clients are and oh don't have anyone on your staff or on your board that feels sorry for the people i just feel mm -hmm. sorry for them i feel mm -hmm. sorry. no no you you want people who you know who expect who expect mm -hmm. your clients to win now what kind of homework can i give them? Right. What, kind, right. what kind of homework you want me to give them well, you know, I was thinking um, what I would love for them to write out what branding their staff would look like. What are some yeah. key things? Okay, I got, an ex I got an assignment. I want you to write out what branding your staff would look like and then blame it on her if you don't do the whole work. <laughs> Let me see what else I could tell you to think about for yourself. I want you to think about If you implemented one thing that you you took from from this this presentation, this conversation, um, what would what would you do? Another thing I say you should do is, if this is useful for you, take this segment right here from the conference and bring your. If you thought this was a useful conversation, 
have your staff come in and watch this. Mm. Use this as a, a learning tool. Have your board members look at this. And the last thing is, what is, if, if it's not the mission statement, what is a statement that the whole, the entire um, staff and board members can create that they say at the beginning of every meeting, mm -hmm. which is grounds them in why we are here. And I'm not talking about the five minute meetings. I'm talking about the two hour meetings, like the board meeting, the the annual something meeting. Mm -hmm. So I hope I was useful. Um, you can find me. Oh, they tell me don't tell people the website anymore. I supposed to say things like you find me on social media, okay? But it's not in the link, so you can't find me. Just go to, to <laughs> Kaishi and she'll find me if you want me. How about that? And they can also Google Unlocking Futures. Oh yeah, it's um NY like New York NY Unlocking Futures dot org. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ms. Claudette. I think that you gave them more than enough gems. Um, and we're going to wrap up. Um, let me thank you all. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. And I'm going to push stop now.